Now we're ready to start looking at the urinary system. This video lecture is going to concentrate on the anatomy of the urinary system, including its structures and location. Then we'll look more at the anatomy of the kidney itself, and even in smaller detail, the nephron and its blood supply, as well as the renal corpuscle. So first, the urinary system, of course, is made up of two kidneys here, two ureters that take the urine from the kidneys and then down to the bladder, and then finally through, it'll go, travel through the urethra. As far as kidney functions go, the kidney first filters blood plasma, eliminating the waste and returning or recycling the good stuff back to the blood. It can also regulate blood volume and pressure, as we have saw with its secretion of renin, which activates angiotensin II, and then aldosterone and how those two uh, increase blood volume. Uh, also, it regulates plasma concentrations of sodium, potassium, chloride, and other ions. The kidneys also secrete erythropoietin. We saw this when we did blood. That controls red blood cell production. And then finally, kidneys are going to regulate acid-base balance. Now, the kidneys aren't the only system that's involved in eliminating waste from the body fluids. Other uh, systems do that. We saw a respiratory system gets rid of CO2 for us. The integumentary system through our sweat can get rid of water, salts, lactic acid, and urea. The digestive system can get rid of water, salts, carbon dioxide, lipids, bile pigments, and cholesterol. And then, of course, then the urinary system is the guy who's going to get rid of the metabolic waste and toxins, some drugs, hormones, salts, hydrogen ions, and water. If we look at the anatomy of the kidney, position-wise, it's considered to be retroperitoneal. That means that it's behind the peritoneal, specifically the parietal peritoneum, at about the level of T12 through L3, so it's tucked just at the bottom part of our ribs here. Also notice that the right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney. That's because the right side has that liver over there kind of pushing that kidney down a little bit. Kidney is not terribly big. It's about the size of a bar of soap and weighs about 160 grams. Shape-wise, it looks like a kidney bean. Of course, the kidney bean is named for the kidney, not the other way around. So the lateral surface is convex, where the medial surface is concave. The kidney also has several connective tissue coverings over it. There's a renal fascia. This is the um, connective tissue responsible for anchoring the kidney to the surrounding tissues to help give it some support and structure. It has a layer of adipose tissue called the adipose capsule that cushions and protects the kidney. And then the renal capsule encloses the kidney like a wrap of cellophane um, wrap around it and therefore providing a real strong protective covering over the kidney. If we're looking at the inside of the kidney, we can think of the kidney as divided into two parts. There's the renal cortex is the outer one centimeter. That's just this outside area. Here would be the cortex. And then inside of that would be the region called the medulla. Um, and that's where you're going to see renal columns and the renal pyramids and then papilla. Now the um, the pyramids have this striped look to them because that's where the collecting ducts, we'll talk about those in a little bit, uh, all come together. And the papilla is basically the tip. It refers to nipple, and that's actually openings of the, collective, uh, the collecting ducts happen at the papilla. The renal columns are simply just part of the cortex, same tissue that extends down between these pyramids. Then there's the renal pelvis. Now that's this area here in yellow. That collects up the um, urine from the papilla as it collect, moves down the collecting tubules down in through the papilla, enters the minor calyxes, and that brings us to the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis then continues is continuous with the ureter, and therefore the urine will leave out the ureter. A renal lobe is a, is a pie section of the kidney. So imagine cutting this kidney up into slices of pie. It's going to have overlying areas of the renal cortex, the renal pyramid, and then the adjacent st tissues of the renal columns would make up one um, lobe. Now pathway of blood through the kidneys it just involves uh, farther and farther division of into smaller blood vessels 
of those arteries until finally you get to the arterioles and then the capillaries. But we're going to have two capillaries in this circulation. So let's just start looking at what's going on. So starting with the renal artery, it is a branch off of the aorta when it enters the kidney and it divides up into segmental arteries. There's like five of those that branch out and then those branch out to interlobular arteries that go up to the cortex. From there you can see names of arteries that are further and further branching until finally you hit the afferent arterial. The afferent arterial feeds into the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the first set of capillaries. It's a cluster of capillaries. We're going to see all the filtration of the blood occurring at that glomerulus. The glomerulus, the blood there, then enters into the efferent arterial, so it's back to an arterial instead of to a, a venule, notice. So we're going to an arterial, and from that arterial then, it branches in, into the second set of capillaries, and that would be the peritubular capillaries, or sometimes you'll hear them referred to as the vasa recta, depending on which nephron we're looking at. From there, the blood collects up into larger uh, veins or venules, and then those continue to um, collect blood until the blood leaves the renal vein and enters the inferior vena cava and it's back to the heart. Now a nephron is the functioning unit of a kidney. It's going to consist of first the Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule, which we can see here. The, this is in the yellow, the glomerulus is the capillaries that I mentioned in the previous side. And so you can see this Bowman's capsule kind of in, surrounds that glomerulus. And that's going to be the site of filtration. Then from there we enter the renal tubules. The renal tubules consist of first the proximal convoluted tubule. That's this part that's proximal because we're saying in reference to the Bowman's capsule. So it's up close to the Bowman's capsule. And it's convoluted. You can see all the curves and bends in it. This is very long. It has simple cuboidal. Those cuboidal have also microvilli, those little finger-like projections of the, of the um, cell membrane to give it more surface area. And from there, it enters into the loop of Henle, this U-shaped bend that we see here with a descending and then ascending limb. This loop of Henle is divided into a thick segment that's actually over here on the ascending limb, the, usually the lateral part of it or the more distal part of the ascending limb, and it's going to have simple cuboidal tissue um, where we're going to see active transport of salts in those, so the ions here. Whereas the thin segment is the length, the rest of the um, loop of Henle, so the entire length of the descending limb and then part of the ascending limb. And that's all simple squamous where we see um, just passive diffusion of water and but no salts. If we keep going with our renal tubule, the next part then is going to be the distal convoluted tubule. In the distal convoluted tubule, it's all cuboidal. Now we don't have as much uh, microvilli though in this region and then from there the um, distal convoluted tubule collects up with the collecting duct which you can see here. Now notice the collecting duct has entrances from very several other distal convoluted tubules that came from other nephrons. So if you look at the flow of the glomerular filtrate once it leaves the the fluids leave the um, glomerulus it's going to enter the glomerulus capsule, then the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron or loop of Henle, um, the distal convoluted tubule, then into a collecting duct. From there, it goes down through the pyramids in exiting the pyramid through the papillary ducts, and that would be minor calyxes to major calyxes, which are considered part of the renal pelvis, and then the renal pelvis itself and then leaving the kidneys, going through the ureter to the urinary bladder to the urethra, and then of course down into your toilet. Now looking a little closer at the renal corpuscle itself, this is the glomerulus plus the Bowman's capsule together. So you've got this big tuft of capillaries here that um, fluid leaves those capillaries 
and enters into this Bowman's capsule. The filtrate then would exit out through the proximal convoluted tubules. You can see here the efferent and the afferent arterioles. Remember the afferent is going to bring blood in. The efferent takes the blood out from the glomerulus. Also, you can see just they threw in here the loop of Henle, its association with glomerulus. Notice that it is positioned, the ascending limb of the loop of Henle is positioned right in between the afferent and efferent arterioles. And we'll come back to that a little later. There are also what are called mesangeal cells that are scattered throughout the glomerulus. These are specialized smooth muscle cells, and they're going to help control the amount of filtration that's happening between the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. If we look at this filtration membrane uh, more closely, what we see here then is um, the endothelium of the capillaries here, and you can see it's fenestrated capillaries. They have those big holes or fenestrations in it. And then in the pink is what's called the basement membrane. And then outside of that is going to be um, cells called pedicels or podocytes. Um, these podocytes, you can see the cell body here, it's like it has long finger-like projections that extend out and wrap around the capillary. And they have then a little extensions from it, and they make these what are called uh, filtration slits. You can see the spacing in between these little fingers that are extending off of the um, podocyte. And that's going to help in regulating what fluids are, uh, can be filtered through this filtration membrane. So let's look at that next. Basically, the fenestrated endothelium is going to allow um, almost everything but blood cells to move through. So those holes are big enough for everything, the plasma proteins, the ions, water, you, hormones, you name it, can go through that, except blood cells are too big, they can't fit through those pores. Next then is the basement membrane, that in the pink again is the basement membrane. Sometimes you'll hear it recall, called the lamina densa. This is a proteoglycan gel layer. Um, that excludes molecules greater than 5 nanometers, so things like big, large plasma proteins are going to be stopped from going through the basement membrane. So that way we can keep the plasma proteins in our blood. They don't become part of the filtrate that we're making. Then this is also has a negative charge to it, so that helps keep negative proteins out of the mix so that they also aren't included in the filtrate. They're stuck in the blood. Then the filtration slits is the next thing it has to go through, right? These little slits here. These slits have very thin membranes extending across the slit, so they're going to prevent a lot of the macromolecules from crossing over the filtration uh, membrane and getting into the Bowman's capsule. So we basically the idea here is we're going to keep the blood cells and the big proteins, plasma proteins, and the big macromolecules um, inside the blood that they never become part of the filtrate. But most other things, all the ions, the water, smaller macromolecules, even like sugars, uh, can get across that filtration membrane and become part of the filtrate. And here's just a different picture of it. Here's actually the, uh, a picture where they took and you can see a red blood cell sitting inside the capillary and then you can see those podocytes and this, um, those filtration um, slits here. And so if you take this square and blow it up, this is what we're looking at. So we've got the pores, the fenestrations in the capillary. Here's the basal mem uh, basement membrane or basal lamina. And then here's the uh, processes of the podocyte. So here's the filtration slits. So anything that moves from the blood has to pass through all those structures and only small things are end up going through and becoming part of the filtrate that would be in the Bowman's capsule. Now there are different types of nephrons. We're not going to get into the importance of the differences between these, but I want to have you know them simply because if you hear them from another source, you'll be familiar with what they're talking about. So the cortical nephrons are the short nephrons. You can see here um, where they just occupy the cortex um, of the kidney itself. So then the other one is the uh, juxtamedullary 
uh, nephrons. These are the ones that have extend into the um, medulla of the kidney. So they have this long loop of Henle. Um, and this is going to be helping in conserving water. Um, so it's a little bit uh, more complicated uh, process, um, involves countercurrents, and we aren't going to be spending any time doing that. It's simply too involved uh, for what we need to understand about kidney functioning. Now the blood supply also is dependent on which type of nephron you're looking at. So the cortical nephrons, those short guys, the capillaries that surround them are called peritubular capillaries, whereas for the juxtamedullary nephron, the capillaries are referred to as vasa recta. So again, we're not going to get into the differences between those two um, and when they're the functional differences on those, um, just in case you hear it named either way, you'll have an idea that we're basically talking about the capillaries surrounding that loop at Henley. The last thing we want to look at in anatomy of the kidney is the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And this is, consists of three different sets of um, cells that are associated with the kidney. Um, one of those is the juxtaglomerular cells here, or they're simply called granular cells. Uh, these granular cells are the ones that are responsible for secreting renin. And you can see they're located right along the side or in the wall, along the wall of the afferent arteriole. Um, and so these, since they secrete renin, they're sensitive to changes in blood pressure. So as blood entered here, you can read the blood pressure these cells can read the blood pressure and secrete renin when that blood pressure drops too low and therefore it'll help raise blood pressure. The other set of cells are called the macula densa cells. These are these cells that are larger than what you see for the rest of that um, ascending loop of Henle. So just in the region of the ascending loop that extends between these afferent and efferent arterioles that's where you see these larger cells and that's what we call the macula densa. These cells have chemoreceptors and they're responsible for um, adjusting or, or responding to changes in sodium chloride level in the, in the filtrate. And so um, they're going to help alter uh, filtration rates in order to uh, respond to those changes in sodium chloride concentrations. Then there's the extra glomerular mesangeal cells. These cells you can see here are located adjacent to the macula densa in the tissue between the afferent, ar afferent arterioles and kind of sandwiched behind the ascending loop of Henle. Um, these guys have interconnected uh, gap junctions, or they have those gap junctions that connect them together, and they can pass regulatory signals between the macula densa and the granular cells to help those two um, types of cells talk to each other. So that's going to end our look at the anatomy. So now we're going to start with the next video lecture looking at filtration and seeing the first step in the formation of urine and that's taking all the good, the bad, and the ugly out of the blood and moving it into the um, kidney tubules.